pattern of addiction. So like really how do we interrupt those patterns that are no longer serving you? Um, and I know that uh, my business partner is, I just want to do a quick shout out. My business partner is on the live. So she's watching. So Laura Macias. So um, we, you know, we have been on this journey together of looking at addiction and a trauma in a different lens. And that like, how do you meet the person where they are truly for their individual journey? So I think it's this, this conversation is so valuable. So thank you, Tara, for, for bringing this to the forefront. Thank you, Casey. I'm so glad when I met you, it was just so serendipitous. And we have a lot of very similar uh, views and, 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 you know, wants for our community. So I'd like to hear from Ilona uh, in regards to response. So um, codependency for me is something that I've lived and experienced. Um, I was very codependent. And I would even say that I am still codependent. It's, it's definitely a journey. Um, while one can say they're in recovery from it, um, it's very easy to fall back into um, the old mindsets because they're easy. Uh, and in some ways they feel good. Um, that's part of what codependency is. There's a part of it that makes you feel good. Um, for me, codependency looks like not being able to say no to someone, even if it was hurting me financially, emotionally, spiritually, or physically. Um, feeling a responsibility to save or fix everyone that I came in contact with, no matter how little I knew them. Um, people pleasing, wanting to make sure everybody around me was happy all of the time, even to my own detriment. Valuing what other people think over my own thoughts. Um, not being able to make decisions um, because I fear the disappointment of others or the disapproval of others. Um, things as small as what we're gonna have for dinner to things as large as what am I gonna do for my career? Um, and then also, um, I think the, the, the aspect of codependency that most people are probably familiar with um, dealing with addiction um, uh, to substances is living or loving, living with or loving someone who has an addiction and enabling them because you're afraid that they will be angry with you. So those are all things that I've experienced through my codependency and that I work on every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah. Michael? Thanks, Kara. Um, and I, I really like uh, what Casey and Alona uh, have said so far. I think. I think things start within, and so I, I want to focus maybe a little bit on, on codependency within myself. Um, you know, and that's part of, you know, growing up in codependency where there's a controller and a kind of a, a dependent uh, roles. Um, typically for people in addiction like myself is we take on both of those roles, and I know I did. So within myself, I have a controller and a dependent and so the addiction cycle for me was this continuous um, uh, rescue mission for myself. Um, just, you know, have a trauma response or a PTSD or maybe anxiety. It just, you know, gets out of control and then disassociate from it. And then here comes the controller. I'm going to rescue you and... You know, and, and, and you just, I got, I got into these cycles where, you know, I, I just, I couldn't stop that. And, you know, part of the healing process, one has been awareness um, when it's going on, when, when my emotions were starting to get um, intense to the point of needing to dissociate from them, uh, having the tools in my kit um, to offer alternatives and then allowing those feelings, um, had to work on, you know, judging my emotions um, and trying to push them down and squash them or, or even to project them onto people that were around me, learning to be able to sit with them. And as I was able to do that, the, you know, the, the controller, the rescue mission didn't really need to take place and started finding some relief there. So. You know, I, I, I just think that, you know, a lot of this codependency and, you know, especially for the addict, 
or the alcoholic is something that's internalized and in both roles are present that, uh, you know, they, as uh, Renee Aram says, you know, we create this addicts loop. So um, great topic though. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Can I jump in with some yeah. additional thoughts? Um, both Alona and Michael, you know, reminded me about like the trauma response when you think about codependency and how um, that really does like hyper independence or hyper dependence mm -hmm. is specific to a trauma response. And the brain actually develops neural pathways that support that. And so that's why those interruptions of patterns. So listening to some of what you're sharing in your narratives and thinking about like what that journey looks like and leaning into the feelings instead of like Michael said, suppressing them um, in our culture, we don't do that. We mask our feelings. And um, that's one of the things that we hope to uncover is that we have no control over our feelings. They just happen. It's what we do with our feelings. That is really the key indicator. So when we think about feelings, we should be celebrating that we get to feel, we get to feel joy and sadness and happiness and not that it's, those are right or wrong. They just are and leaning into that more and more. So I really appreciate what both of them shared. Yeah, yeah, um, me too. You know, for those of you that don't know, Michael and I are married and we have been working on our codependency and trauma responses inside of our marriage. And it has been one of the most difficult journeys I think that uh, I've ever been on, but one of the most beautiful and gratifying experiences, you know, to be able to see where I need to work on myself through my triggers and my reactions so clearly and to cycle through those and to learn how to feel that full range of emotion that Casey's talking about, right? That is the full human experience is to allow them to come and not judge, but rather just embrace the self, you know, um, the, the issue that we have with our society is that we have squashed, like Michael said, these emotions down so far that they're coming out sideways, you know, so the healing path is the feeling path. Like, how can we feel, you know, our way into wholeness and to wellness? I mean, the emotions, there's so many gifts and it's just, it's just not taught. So I really like this conversation. This is really great. Uh, so uh, the next question that I have for you all is, so on the, you know, on the topic of trauma, so this has come up. So codependency is often associated with trauma, but people often minimize their traumas because someone else has it worse. How do you overcome this barrier when dealing with codependency? Michael, do you want to start this time? So how do we overcome the barrier of, of trauma um, in, in relation to codependency? I, I found as I journeyed through that and I started to be able to unpack my trauma, you know, the codependency is so kind of pervasive and so unconscious. It, it really, it was almost, I don't know, masked by, by the trauma. Um, just because going in, going into PTSD and, you know, and it's really about connection. When I would go into PTSD or have a trauma uh, event, I would disconnect from myself. And we know what happens, you know, physiologically when we're being chased by the, the saber tooth tiger, right? All the blood leaves our frontal cortex and it goes into our, into our extremities so that we can run. And when that happens, we lose the ability to be, have rational thought because um, it's all about survival at that point. So being able to try to be rational or to think when we're in this 
you know, when I'm in this uh, condition or I'm having this, this trauma response. So, you know, like we did, you know, grounding um, is, is vital. And then, you know, getting someplace safe, you know, that's kind of my, my basics. And then from there, you know, just trying to, you know, working with the body and releasing the energy, whether it's through energy medicine or meditation, um, and just trying to release that energy that's, that's all kind of stuck in, in the body where you just feel like the on button is stuck. From there, you know, it was, I was able then to, you know, the body kind of regaining balance, able to really begin to see then how that was the setup for me for, like I had said, for that controller to come in, you know, and, and to do the rescue and whether, it, you know, it was food or, you know, any, any addiction, you know, smoking or, uh, alcohol, drugs, any of that. It, it could also be, you know, relationships. It could be, you know, process addictions, um, you know, turn on the TV, um, social media, you know, all, work, all of those things. It, it was just a way to, that I was trying to rescue myself. And, you know, it, it's just through going through those cycles is, in allowing myself and being aware of them is really what started to bring clarity. You know, for me, it really started with the awareness. Thank you for sharing. So we do have a question. I want to kind of do a segue because we have a question online. So it says, please define trauma when it isn't connected with codependency. Casey, I'm going to have you answer that. So trauma can be individually defined. So it can be, it's a life altering event that is where there is, whether it's perceived or reality of risk of death or serious grave danger to self. So again, that's through everybody's individual lens. So trauma, that's why it's very hard to say trauma is this and trauma is not that is because it is very personal, but it is that life altering moment where you've had to rescue yourself, you were forced. Um, so Michael's referred to PTSD a couple of times. So that's post traumatic stress disorder. And that's typically where you've had one life altering event, it could be a car accident, a traumatic birth, a, um, a loss of a loved one, your, um, so you get to define for yourself what that really looks like, but it's where you're not able to move forward. You get stuck in that trauma response. And then Tara referred to um, a trigger. So a trigger could be something where then you're having a flashback. So in the present future, you are experiencing your normal everyday life. And then all of a sudden you see, or you hear a sound, you smell something, you have a flashback in your memory um, where you can have live, like you're sitting in your moment of reliving the event. So it happens probably the best example is when someone is in a car accident and they go through that same intersection as an example, and you have like a flashback of, and you freeze and your body um, like freezes in that uh, your amygdala, the fight, flight, freeze or fawn response kicks in and you're not able to move your body through that. And that's where, um, you know, we really spend a lot of time looking at that and that the brain, the brain actually starts to look and respond differently than someone that has not experienced something that would be in their world experience, um, considered a trauma event. Yes. So trauma is a highly personalized experience. And I often, most recently, I've been talking about, uh, knowing your partner's triggers or trauma responses is a love language in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, to be able to be very gentle at times I am so that, you know, that we are able to have a good relationship. Um, so I have another question too, and I think this is going to play on uh, Casey with what we were just talking about, but does one have to have trauma to be codependent? 
or does one even recognize that they may have had trauma, which in turn makes a codependent? I'm going to say no to both questions. Anything is possible. So the, the, my hope for everyone's takeaway from hearing this conversation is that your journey, your, I call it oftentimes an adventure because life is full of twists and turns is a hundred percent individual. Even if you are in a partnership, you are still an autonomous person and you can become enmeshed in that relationship, but you are still your own person. So you get to define for yourself what that looks like. And, um, we oftentimes that's where we go that no that feels too much I don't want to feel all of that we want to wipe away our tears we want to um, shy away from our rage so encouraging like where do we actually allow ourselves to feel what's happened and that's that's the best way to move forward is how do you move it out of the body One of the things that I heard um, a couple of weeks ago on a podcast that I was listening to is that humans, we tighten up when we are having a feeling response. In animals, they start the shivering where their bodies shiver to move the feelings like if uh, like a lion's chasing whatever that animal that they like to um, enjoy and they they've escaped and then they shiver. That's the trauma leaving their body. That's a natural innate system that we are created with. And somehow over generations, we have stopped doing that. So to move the feelings out of our body, we actually have to move. My patients, I'm always like, stretch your arms, move your neck, move your shoulders, because it settles in your joints first. Then it settles in your organs. It settles in your muscles because we don't know what else to do with it. So we, we hold on to it. And now we have chronic health conditions. I have COPD. I have a, a very extensive trauma history. And so like my, I have internalized a lot of things. So how do you move forward from that? And that's really starting to understand what your own body's responses to those things. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Ilona, so I know that uh, we can minimize trauma, right? How do you, how did you deal with that when you started to figure out that you maybe were minimizing? Yeah, so the first thing is to recognize that minimizing your own trauma is an excuse to not heal um, in a way. And it's also, um, it's also in itself codependent because you're making everyone else's problems more important and more valuable than yours. Um, So like Casey said earlier, trauma is um, self-defined. So we've taken as a society, the idea of putting labels on everything. And so your experience is worse than mine or my experience is worse than yours. And it can't, we haven't allowed ourselves to just say we're each having an, an experience and they are what they are for each of us. Um, I think the important thing, once you're willing to accept the idea that you've experienced a trauma and you're allowing yourself to not minimize it is to talk to somebody that you trust, somebody that you're not in a codependent relationship with, maybe even a professional, um, and talk through those things that you're calling little traumas talk through them and the emotions that go along with them because that person, if they're truly the person that you should be talking to is going to validate your feelings. Um, And having that validation is what's going to help you move through them and then allow you to start to work on the bigger picture, um, the bigger, the bigger idea of codependency itself. But I really think acknowledging that, Truthfully, we've all experienced some sort of trauma, but because of that idea of labels, we're too afraid to call it that because we don't want somebody who's been in a horrific car crash to feel like we're minimizing their problem. So we minimize our own instead. Um, So it's that recognition and then taking that first step of saying, this happened to me and I feel this way and allowing somebody to say to you, I understand why you would feel that way allowing somebody to say that to you and accepting it. 
Thank you. That's so beautiful. Yes. Uh, so on Facebook, we have another question uh, and I'll pose it to Casey again. Can you expand on hyper independence? Yes. So hyper independence would be someone, and I'm going to use myself as the example. Um, I don't ask for help. If someone um, says, and I think one of my friends is actually on the live, so I'm just going to use her as an example. So um, she, for a year, was picking up my son for school because she was transporting her son. So it just was easy. But every morning I text her and said, are you going to pick up my son? She's like, yes, I pick him up every day. That's what we agreed upon. But every day I did that for almost the entire academic year. Because my view is I don't trust that you're going to show up for me. So I'm going to continue to show up for myself. So hyper-independence, you're, you're, you overwork, you overcompensate, you make sure that um, you hear about the type A personalities or perfectionism or OCD tendencies can be that hyper-independence. So looking at like you make sure that you only do for yourself. Um, I have wonderful people in my life, but they will tell you if they were like, could voice in right now that I'm not going to pick up the phone and call someone and say, Hey, I'm struggling today. My hope is, is that somebody will see that I'm struggling and that they'll show up for me, but I'm not going to ask. And so how do you start to make that shift? So hyper-independence is that you are in have internalized everything and you're not leaning in any space. Um, one of the new things that I've been starting to share with a lot of my patients is we talk about um, barriers or walls that we've put up. And so reframing things that for me, sometimes a wall is a place to lean to rest. And I think, didn't I share that with you, Tara, when we yeah. talked? And I've thought about it. Yes. So like, how do we create a space because it's exhausting to be hyper independent or hyper dependent because there is no place of rest because you're continuously thinking and thinking and thinking your brain, like the flooding of thoughts and um, like the, the hyper vigilance. Um, you go into a store and you are looking always like you're aware of your surroundings. That's the trauma response of the hyper-independence. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so Karina on, online says, I feel exactly like that. So what kind of suggestions do you have for those who are watching, maybe like some tools that they can use to be able to become more balanced in relationship? My, my number one, recommendation always is, is find something, even if it's a baby step. So if you have something that's what I call a micro hurt. So, you know, we tend to define things that, that wound us as like these big events, but these micro hurts where you hurt, had a conversation with someone and they, you, you kind of did this like, Ooh, I felt that mm -hmm. like right here mm -hmm. and to voice that to say, you know, I felt that. Because then in the flip side is you get to then share that that felt good if someone shares something kind, because then you're able to receive those blessings. Casey, you look really pretty today. I love that you got the, you know, I'm a power word person. So I got my strong shirt on today. And, and say, thank you. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for holding space for me. And we tend not to do that for each other, especially if you're on like the trauma response side, we're like, oh, they saw me. Oh no, I'm going to hide myself. So to not hide in finding those little tiny steps and say, okay, this person, identify someone you feel safe with. And that's the key is that not everybody in those moments you feel safe with. So where, and I'm talking about not just physical safety, but emotional safety and mental safety. Yeah, that's really great. Um, great advice for sure. So that brings me to this next question I want to pose to you all. So 
we, you know, we often think codependency as a personal issue. What about community dependency? So that's the other side of the coin, right? Not hyper dependent or what, what did you call it, Casey? Hyper independence. Yeah. Or yeah. So, but to be dependent in a, in a community setting where we're very dependent on what other people are doing or what they're not doing. Um, how, so how do you define, how do you define this? How do you um, define this and then work towards solutions for codependency in that regard? Does that make sense? Is that towards me or are we asking somebody else? <laughs> so um, let's go with, let's go with Michael this time again. Thanks. The, it's a great question. It's, it's really hard to grow up in, in our Western culture and not be impacted by codependency. I mean, from, from the very beginning, we're bombarded with, you know, media and marketing that says you have to have this car to be happy and this house to be happy. And it, I mean, we're taught from the beginning that happiness lies outside of ourselves the message is, is that of our, of, you know, by ourselves, we're, we're not enough. And, you know, it's so subtle um, and, and it's so pervasive. And that's why I think it's so unconscious. And it starts permeating then into our communities. Um, and I, I mean, as, as an example, you know, if I just look at the two political systems we have, I mean, right, it's one is, Kind of, you know, the dependent and the, the you know, we're going to take care of you guys and we're going to help and which is good. And I think that there should be a landing, a land, a soft landing place for people that are struggling. Um, sometimes they, they take that too far to get votes and, and it, it, it creates that imbalance of the, the dependent and the controller. And then, and then on the other side, we have, you know, the other side, it's totally the controller. You know, we don't need anybody, uh, like Casey said, almost, you know, hyper-independent. And, you know, and it starts permeating. I mean, it starts going through our communities, um, you know, whether it's, you know, along racial lines or maybe religious lines, you know, and we start to see these dynamics, um, you know, coming through. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's the inner, our inners will, you know, matches the outer. So we're creating outside of ourselves in our communities, the things that are going on within us. So for me to just stop and look at my surroundings and what was present in my life really kind of told the story of what was going on inside of me. And, you know, that's, again, some of that awareness um, that we can use to to really use as a springboard to beginning to understand and dismantle this codependency and in reclaiming our authentic self. Ilona, what do you think? Um, so I have a different example for community codependency. And my example is bars and restaurants. Um, and the idea that you can't go to a bar or a restaurant without it being associated with alcohol. It's either a bar or restaurant that serves alcohol, or it's the place people go when they're trying to recover from having drunk too much alcohol. And then the idea also that while you're in that establishment that serves alcohol, if you choose not to drink, either your the people in your surroundings or the uh, wait staff are encouraging you to partake because that's the social norm. And so it's this idea that people have where um, you can't not drink because it's not acceptable in in, um, in the surroundings that you're in. And our society not giving people the permission, so to speak, to say no to that. Um, it's 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 a small example of community codependency, but it's a play, it's a it's a situation where um, the ideas of everyone else are coming at you and are being made to, be more important than the, than the ideas that you have of not drinking for whatever reason that is. 
Um, for me, as somebody who is um, in recovery from alcoholism, it's difficult to go into those situations sometimes and have the wait staff and the people at the table and the people next to you looking at you funny when you have a glass of water instead of alcohol all night. Um, and then the idea of not wanting to go to a restaurant all the time that has alcohol. Like I want to go somewhere where that's not the thing. Like what you can't even go play pool or darts without alcohol being involved. So um, things like the sober bar in Lansing that is um, either going to open or has already opened. Great start. Things like the Serenity House where we have an opportunity to go do something that doesn't involve alcohol. Um, these opportunities for the community where it's we're in environments where it's normal not to drink, I think will help people with that codependency. Um, drinking itself can be a codependent behavior because you're afraid not to drink with the people that you're around. Um, saying no will make you feel different or make you stand out. And so you have to choose between, are these the people that I want to be around? And sometimes that's your family and that's the only people that you have. Um, or do I need to find other people? Um, and those are hard choices to make. Yeah. Casey, what do you think? Um, so before I answer this question here, I want to back up to the previous question because I just want to offer about the um, someone has it worse mentality. And Brene Brown talks about in her um, emotional intelligence book, comparative suffering. And that we tend to, as people, compare our suffering to someone else instead of saying, I'm hurting and you're hurting and each has equal value. So being mindful that there is no comparison. My feelings, going back to that validity of your feelings and what I feel in the moment is as powerful as it gets. So knowing that um, I'm hurting Tara's hurting, Alona's hurting, Michael's hurting, but they're all different, but they're all of equal value. And so there is, there is no comparison because we're individuals and honoring that for ourselves. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there. Um, and like, really, where do we lean into the vulnerability of that? So really thinking about, okay, what does this look like? So um, I just had to get a shout out. She's, you know, she does some incredible work around shame and vulnerability. So I think it's an important piece for this codependency conversation. And then um, coming to back to our last question that we're at right now. So in my world, we call um, community in a lot of ways, systems theory. So we're all a part of a system. We don't work in isolation. We don't live in isolation. Even if you're out there in the world, like in the forest, you, you got something from somewhere. You're a part of some system. Um, even if you only partake of it once a year, you're still a part of a system. So thinking, what is it that you wanna build within your community, whether it's, um, I think Alona just said about your family, if that's all you have, but they are part of that codependent relationship and it's no longer serving you, where do you find community that resonates with your spirit, with your, your, your thoughts, with your motivation for change? So like finding new spaces that you can build community um, is incredibly, incredibly valid and important um, because, you know, People don't get to be mean to you. They don't get to talk down to you, but we do. And because they're family or this is my friend, that's, that's not a safe space. So how do you find safe spaces in community so that we think about systems? And sometimes it's a parallel journey. And sometimes those parallel journeys like intersect and finding those powerful intersections is is really, really important when we're talking about codependency and addiction. And that's that interrupted, up, interruption of behaviors or patterns that are no longer serving you. We have a question, Casey, online. So back to the Brene Brown. Uh, I, she says, I struggle with other people have it worse than me. How do I get over that or work through it? It's a journey because we've told ourselves these narratives. We have these, these internal thoughts. 
which everyone has, like normalizing that everyone has internal thoughts. We're all thinking our own thoughts in our brains right now as we're, as I'm talking, um, those, that's normal. But where do you find, again, leaning into a safe space? Do you either finding professional help like myself or finding someone or an organization like Serenity House and saying, okay, this, I can, I can feel in community in this space because it feels supportive of the journey that I'm on. So, um, and knowing that I'm going to go back to your thoughts and feelings are hundred percent valid and that someone else's journey is their journey. And that's valid as well. But how do you honor your own journey and staying in that space and saying, I get to, I get to say this hurts or this feels good. I feel happy today. I feel sad today. And I always, you know, I encourage my, my patients to, you know, happiness and sadness are equally valid. We need all of that. So how do you create a space that feels peaceful for you? Because we, we hear the narrative is I want a happy life. That's a, an impossible goal because happiness is like sadness. It's a fleeting feeling. It doesn't stay with us. But how do you create a peaceful space? So really leaning into what serves you and finding safe spaces to either explore someone that's willing to ask those challenging questions because you have to interrupt the thought patterns because that's the thing with the brain. Neural pathways, whew, it takes a lot of energy sometimes to reshape and reform what your thought processes are, but you get to define what that looks like. That's wonderful. So I think that, you know, the thought that came up is in our society and the codependent society that we live in right now, a lot of gaslighting is happening, uh, <laughs> right? A lot of people not validating other people's feelings or their experiences. So how as a society can we begin to, uh, I guess, alleviate that in a way maybe not alleviate, but make people aware of it, right? Because I think there's a really lack of awareness around it. So um, let's do popcorn style. So who feels called to talk? I guess I would say that we have to, if we're, if we're a person who is aware of gaslighting or even aware of codependency, um, being strong enough and aware enough to point it out when it's happening, um, point it out when someone's talking about it happening to them, um, and, and being cautious with that, recognizing that saying this to someone could trigger them in ways that we're not aware of. So being gentle with what we're saying, but still recognizing that it's okay to say, hey, this is happening, and it's not okay that that's happening. Um, but I also think another thing that we can do is to um, reduce the stigma with asking for professional help. Um, the thing is, is we're not seeking professional help because we're broken. We're seeking professional help because our toolbox doesn't have all the tools in it that we need to solve the thing that's happening to us in this moment. And asking somebody else for help is asking for additional tools to put in our toolbox. It's no different than going to Home Depot because you don't have the right size screwdriver. Um, it's really just taking care of yourself and not allowing somebody to tell you that you're broken because you've asked for that help. It's not that you're broken, it's that you're strong enough to say I need a different tool. And I'm gonna pick back on Alona's um, statement about brokenness. Um, and in the Japanese culture, there is a beautiful, beautiful example of how you take, um, they take something that's broken and they fill it with gold. So it fills in the cracks and it redefines and makes it something richer and um, more stable and so beautiful and profound and unique where it's a hundred percent individual because the brokenness um, in each of us, whatever that looks like, we get to like fill it in with something that um, makes us feel whole and new and in joyful ways, 
you know, makes us curious about ourselves, makes us excited to like figure out what this next little adventure is going to be like. Um, so I share, I share that message a lot because I hear this brokenness and um, none of us are broken. None of us are broken. And I, I want everyone to hear that we are not broken. We have things that we need to learn, things that no longer serve us. And that's okay. And we can move those to the side and we can release them. But we get to fill in that space with something that's powerful and beautiful. And we get to define that for ourselves. So none of us are broken. Yeah, yeah that's kind of the, uh, Casey, that's kind of the, the spiritual secret that uh, we find out somewhere down the, down the path. And um, I think just to kind of dovetail onto that, the, you know, for myself and, you know, we talk about gaslighting for me, it was, it was an absolute survival skill um, and something that served me well at a time. And, you know, being being a little older, gaslighting wasn't a term that was around when I was growing up, but, you know, I think the, that the answer for me is, is radical compassion. And I mean, that's what I had to have for myself um, as part of this healing with, without that radical compassion to allow and to, to look at what is really there. I wouldn't have made very much progress. And because I've gotten to know myself so well, I can recognize that if someone's gaslighting me or there's, there's something else, I, I can just see it. I see it as the trauma response. So their, their, their soul's evolution and where they're at in their journey, they they, they need to hold on to this, this narrative for protection. Um, and some, you know, I, I don't even know if I want, really want to argue with them anymore or try to change their mind or get them to not believe. I just let them have their thought. And, but I, because I've, I've done the path and I know myself and I began, you know, I'm healing my own wounds. I'm not so much needed for validation on the outside. So if somebody says, you know, if I said, you know, I have to go to the bathroom and they go, no, you don't. I mean, I know that I have to go to the bathroom. I, I don't have to question myself anymore. And I don't need to really argue with anybody anymore either. Um, and then where it goes from that might probably will depend on our relationship and, you know, where we're at from there. So, you know, that's one of the gifts that, uh, that this journey has given me is, is this radical compassion. And, you know, and I think that's also a gift with addiction. Without addiction, it, it would not have broken apart my um, this paradigm that I've lived with, um, where I, you know, I picked up all of these beliefs, not even knowing if they were mine, and I, you know, I made them my own, and I defended them almost to the death. And addiction for me and the codependency is what broke broke me open um, to take a look and begin the healing process. So definitely uh, look at it today as a gift. Can I just say, Michael, that was powerful to say radical compassion. Um, we, we, talk, we talk about radical transformation, but compassion, that is, that's such a gift and um, leaning into the breaking yourself open. Um, and that's something that reminds me, I, I help a lot of my patients create mantras, like something that really resonates with you so that you can have um, a space where when things start to feel overwhelming, where do you, how do you reaffirm like you're in the right place, you're doing going in the right direction when you hear someone gaslighting you and gaslighting really just means for those of you that maybe are not familiar with that term, it really is just getting a message from someone like Michael said, you're wrong. And, but no, I know my, like, no, this is no, no. And then you start to doubt yourself because you've heard this message over and over again. And you're like, oh, ooh. and so then you start to become like hyper flex about like your responses. And then there's inconsistencies. 
So one of the mantras that I often say with my patients is, is you are worthy of kindness and consideration. Everyone, regardless of who you are, your life circumstances is worthy of kindness and consideration. And how do we treat each other in those ways? Yeah, yeah, Michael does, uh, you know, he does have radical compassion and there are days that I have and he will just kind of hold space for me and he'll just kind of, and I'll, I'll see it on his face and I'll, it reflects back to me such a, that I, I can feel it and it softens me when I'm having a day like that. So um, thank you for sharing um, so let's go ahead and move to, uh, the last question of the night. Cause it's, I think this might take maybe the most time, but so at Serenity house, self-care is in our culture. So it is a crucial step, uh, to recovery, um, from addiction, codependency, trauma. So I want to discuss now, what are some of your suggested self-care practices? So what do you use in your life? Popcorn style. I'll go first again. <laughs> um, first, I just want to touch on that radical compassion for a quick second, um, because um, the, the context that is being talked about right now is radical compassion for others, for someone who is portraying an action or words towards you. Um, and I just want to remind all of us that it's also important to have that same radical compassion towards yourself. Um, I think finding that and practicing that is one of the most valuable tools for the journey to recovery. And that's whether it's recovery from substance use, from trauma or from codependency. It's just very valuable to be able to have that radical compassion for yourself as well. Um, as far as, um, self-care, um, if you're someone who suffers from or has suffered from or is experiencing trauma, codependency, addiction, I would encourage you to find at least some self-care practices that are trauma-informed. And the reason for that is they give you the opportunity to make some choices that you don't even know that you're making, but it's a practice for you to move forward um, in learning how to be less codependent. So what do I mean by that? Um, for example, find a yoga class that uses suggestions in instead of demands. Um, don't, it's, it's instead of put your foot here, it's try putting your foot there. If that doesn't feel good, move it to the right or left. Someone who's, who's giving you the opportunity to make the choice of where your foot's going to go, but also listen to your body. If that doesn't feel good, move it. So you're learning to listen to not only, you're learning not only to make choices for yourself, but also to listen to your body. Um, I do the same thing with meditation. So um, if it feels good to you, close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes to meditate but that's just a suggestion, giving, the, um, giving people an opportunity to um, make those choices. Um, we do the same thing in Reiki. We ask people if they would like us to lay hands directly on them or use a hover technique, giving them an opportunity to make choices. Um, and while those are all um, self-care techniques that you can uh, use to you know, go somewhere and, and practice this self-care, you can also do things at home, drink water, Give your body water. It needs it. Um, meditating at home, reading a book, taking a bath or a shower. Um, I play around with singing bowls, attending a spiritual event or group, um, listening to my favorite music, which again is kind of in that codependency idea of, do you always let somebody else choose the music because you're afraid to say what you like? Take some time to listen to what you like when you're by yourself. Then you may have that practice of saying what you want with your when you're with other people. Same thing with TV or movies or whatever. Um, I also use essential oils. Sometimes those 
um, smells or even flowers, having flowers in the house, those scents bring me joy. They bring me, um, they bring me feelings of love. Um, finding things that are good memories for you and focusing on those. Having a memory box, just a small box that has um, very specific things for you. Maybe it's a recording of your favorite song. Maybe it's a flower that's important to you. Maybe it's a poem. Um, maybe it's a piece of a blanket that is comforting to you. Finding these small things to put in a box that when you're struggling, you can grab that box and pick out those things um, that will bring you comfort. I don't think there's anything left. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I, th I think for, for me, um, so I guess just self-care, the, the word balance comes to mind. So, you know, Alona touched on a lot of, a lot of topics and, and ways. So I, I try to set my self-care plan, you know, emotionally, spiritually, financially, um, my time management, um, just try to, trying to create balance. Um, some, sometimes it looks different. Uh, there's times where I need to time to myself, um, to, to work through something or to get through something. Um, I also tend to be one of those people that recharges their battery by, um, kind of being alone or being in a quiet place. I don't necessarily need to be alone, but just in a quiet place. Um, I know other people that they recharge your battery by being around people, you know, extroverted. So I, I just think the key word is, is really balance. You know, if I'm, you know, making sure that I'm not working too much or I'm not playing enough, um, you know, you know, whether, you know, doing energy medicine or um, working with people uh, in a healing um, setting, just trying to keep balance. And, and I know that when I can do that, when I'm balanced within, I tend to be balanced outside of myself too. And, you know, and I think part of that is, you know, having an accountability partner, you know, and that's something that we talk about at the Serenity House and as part of our self-care plan is having an accountability partner um, that, uh, you know, we can kind of go over this and, and trust me, there are times that I get very out of unbalanced and, uh, you know, and Tara's like there for me and she, hey, <laughs> you know, come back in there from left field. You know, and, and I really appreciate that and, and having those people in my life that that care enough about me to, you know, to let me know in a kind way that, uh, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. So, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, an integral part of my life. So thank you. And I'll just round out the this part of the conversation. Um, in my work, self-care is like, one of the things that is really talked about, um, there has been some, some new conversations around maybe rewording some things so that it doesn't, it's more inclusive instead of exclusive. So like access, so thinking about access. So, so not everyone understands or has access to certain things. So one of the things that I've started thinking about is self-awareness, so care for self. So how do you create space for yourself? Um, so really discovering, like creating those spaces and, you know, how do you then connect back to yourself? So we talk about grounding. Um, it doesn't have to be all of anything big or major. It can be, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to look out the window and I'm going to watch the clouds float by. That's care for self because you're disconnecting from whatever is in front of you for just a moment and you're reflecting internally. And we're, we're holding space for ourselves and saying, okay, okay, I can breathe through this and I'm gonna move on to the next thing, especially, you know, work related things. Oftentimes we can't get up and walk away from our jobs, but we're feeling the stress, we're feeling the pressure, we're feeling the, you know, like it's knocking into us all of the time. And how in those moments when you can't walk away, can you say, I'm gonna take a moment for myself? So visualizing an image. 
using power words, um, things that are, it doesn't have to be a tangible that you're going to pick up and say, this is me taking care of myself. Um, I have my black obsidian. So putting this, it's always by my computer because I know for me, it deflects the micro energies that are coming through. Eep, there we go. Kara showed me her selenite. Oh, and there's Jade. Yep, good stuff. So there we go. Like it. So finding tools and like Alona said, your toolbox, really thinking about ways that you are celebrating you in the moment, even if it's internally and no one knows that you're doing anything. And then my final thought, well, I have lots of thoughts about this, but my final thought is really finding ways that you feel joyful and curious about yourself. We tend to, um, especially the older we get, lose that, that childlike like curiosity about life and adventure. And life is an adventure, even with the dips and valleys, the highs and lows. Um, those, of, those individuals that str struggle with any type of addiction, whether it's a specific substance, whether it's sex, whether it's gambling, whether it's pornography, whether it's relationships, um, like how do you create space to say, do I have to have this to survive? No, I need me to survive and I need to keep breathing. And sometimes that's enough, reconnecting back to your breath and finding joy in that I can fill my lungs up today. And this is a celebration. So that's kind of my little two cents there. That's awesome. Yes, because I was going to say laughter, right? Like just to have that deep belly laugh, which I had one today and it felt amazing. Yes. Yes. So, so thank you, Casey, for joining us. So how would somebody get a hold of you if they wanted to uh, work with you? Um, really great question, but I've been because Tara just said laughter and she had the belly laugh. Yes. I also want to encourage if you feel safe in the moment, that if you feel tearful, don't wipe them away. Let them come. Let them just come down your cheeks. That's the, the best healing. Laughter and unfiltered tears. And we tend to not lean into the tears because we think they'll never stop once they start. And you'll find that they stop pretty quickly if you let them come without wiping them away. Cause wiping them away is also hiding from yourself because you don't want other people to see your pain. So leaning into like the feeling again, um, if you want to reach out to us, we are on, we have Facebook, we're living in the pause um, PLC on Facebook. We um, both Laura and myself have psychology today profiles. Um, you can find us there. Um, I did have a website, but you know, it, we're a little overwhelmed. <laughs> so, um, but we, we love talking to individuals about their journey and that it's, it's very, um, it's, it's walking alongside someone and we're not here to direct anyone's journey. Um, and any, any good clinician is just there to walk alongside you as you discover um, your, your next steps, whatever that may be for you. Thank you. Ilona, Serenity House, tell me about your programs before we end the conversation. Yeah, definitely. We have, um, we have programming just about every day through the week. Mondays, we have a family yoga program, which is at 6.30. Um, it's geared towards kids 13 and under, 12 and under, actually. Um, counter to that, on Thursdays at 6 p.m., we have an adult teen program that... Um, so 13 and up, generally speaking. Friday nights, we have our holistic healing hour um, that starts at 6 p.m. The first Friday of every month is aromatherapy and AccuDetox. And then the other Fridays are um, recovery Reiki and talking circles. And we will soon be adding in um, some EFT with those talking circles. So it's the opportunity to experience the emotional freedom technique or tapping. Um, and then um, Wednesdays, we're running a program with the uh, Genesee County Courts, with the sobriety court and the drug court, um, so that you can get referred from the courts to our programming. Um, and those are on Wednesdays by referral only. So if you are a person who is in drug court or sobriety court, you can talk to your probation officer about that, and they may be able to refer you to our program. And then on the third Saturday of every month, we have acupuncture. 
I think I covered them all. <laughs> yes, I think you did a really good job. So again, thank you so much. And to all of our viewers, thank you for coming and listening to this round table. Codependency is a very, very big issue, but a very healable issue, right? So it's something that we can together overcome through these conversations, awareness, and walking that healing path together, like Casey said, side by side. So have a wonderful night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Great job, everybody, thanks. Okay. I stopped the live stream, so we're off. Okay. So yeah, Casey, so the, we had 23 viewers on Facebook. So wow. we, yeah, and we had a lot of engagement. Yeah, people were really excited about this. You know, the thought that I have, and we can keep talking about it, is that codependency is in our mission statement and is something that we need to kind of, right, Alona, bring more uh, more of these kinds of talks. So I'd be interested in talking with you more about maybe doing something monthly like this and kind of spreading that awareness in our community. So, yeah, because there's so much, I have so many other notes, you know, with PTSD and CPTSD and, um, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And, you know, there's so many, like the response side. So there's lots of things that we could. Um, it was fun to watch on my other screen as people were like popping things in there. It was pretty cool. I was like, oh, look at us. <laughs> like grown ups and stuff. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it, it did. It turned out really good. I think we did a good job. Um, yeah, I know that I popped around a little bit too. And I know that, yeah. So were you guys okay with that? Kind of like ad libbing a little bit for you guys? I know you guys were like the list and I'm yeah, like, no, we're going to answer them. I was like, wait order, a second, Sarah. wait. <laughs> what number is that? Wait. <laughs> it's like, I need my readers on. I can't <laughs> see the writing. Did I miss that question? <laughs> I, I was good though. It gave us kind of like that, right? Like really just engagement and like, um, overcoming the feelings, right? Cause we need to overcome those feelings so that we can begin to really do the message, right? In a way that, you know, cause it does, it, it, it doing these videos are, they're interesting. Mm -hmm. so. It is interesting to not know who's on the other side of the screen besides those that are here. So I was like, you know, I rearranged my space. Cause I'm like, okay, people can see this much of my world, you know, like being very, um, and I, I just have to say, like, thank you for including me. And um, I am so, like, I don't even know how to say that I'm so happy to have spent the last hour with Alona because I haven't seen her since 1991. I know, <laughs> we, right? <laughs> we graduated from high school together. And all I've been thinking for the last hour is Noni K. I just had I know. Her. I thought that all night last night. I'm like, I can't wait to see Noni K tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are both powers graduates because we have Erwin McCone on the other end and he went to powers too I think that he graduated uh he I think he was a senior our freshman year okay yeah yeah so um he said I would love he said this is fantastic I hope you guys do it again and I would love to promote it through my social media great stuff um I had students log in and stuff so you know nice Cool. I got my text messages are like, doo, 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 doo. This is awesome. I'm like, I don't know how to set it up. So, you know, I have to have a whole training on how you did this cool stuff, but I don't know how to do any of that. But um, so, you know, you might have a whole bunch of future social workers that are like, this is good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So um, let's keep the conversation going. Um, me and Alona will recap this Friday and we're going to talk about ways where we can build off of this. So, um, because people need it. Oh my gosh, the the fun. We need people don't even yeah, people don't even know about that, right? And that's what's happening. Well, right right. That's the new research. So the four Fs now is what they're talking about from the the amygdala. So um, and I just want to say my, my Laura, my business partner, she is a gerontologist. So there's this whole world of older adults okay. that with sobriety, substance use, um, mental health concerns. 
um, like enmeshment within their family. So if that's the direction, I don't know if you've started to explore with older adults, um, that world too. So yeah, we, so we serve mostly white women ages 30 to 40 right now. Um, so right now our health disparities is to get into the LGBTQ community and the African-American and Latino community uh, with this grant funding we'll get. But seniors, I would love to work with seniors too uh, because of the wisdom. Mm -hmm. The wisdom. I mean, I can sit with a 70, 80 year old person and just like, just tell me things. And I just, I just have always with older people. Um, so, but yeah, so um, yeah. So it's good. Recorded. Do, is there a way that I can have this and get yeah. your permission that I could share with my students? Yeah, for sure. We're actually recording this conversation too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't oh, know. It's still recording. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Cause I didn't get,